Um, it's my honor to um, welcome Mariana Chilton uh, to our, I'm going to say we're about into number 15 of our grad rounds that we started back in 2021. And this is um, for the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health. Every month we host a guest who's really thinking about some of the critical social issues that are facing our communities and, and, and the public health. And so it's a privilege to introduce you, Dr. Shilton. Um, your talk is Solving Hunger Without Food and Other Healing-Centered Approaches for Public Health. And I loved reading your bio, so I'm gonna read this quickly. That you founded the Center for Hunger-Free Communities and the Witness to Hunger Movement to increase women's participation in the national dialogue on hunger and poverty. She's a principal investigator of the Building Wealth and Health Network designed to incentivize entrepreneurship and self-sufficiency in the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. For 15 years, she was co-PI on the Children's Health Watch and her research addresses trauma, food insecurity, and advancement of human rights. She has served as co-chair of the Bipartisan National Commission on Hunger meant to advise Congress in the United States Department of Agriculture on how to end hunger in America. And she has testified before the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate. She has also served as an advisor to the Institute of Medicine, and I think more importantly, to Sesame Street. With that, I will turn it over to you. And we look forward not only to your presentation, but having a discussion following your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. And thank you so much to uh, all of you for being here. I'm really delighted and honored to uh, share some things I'm thinking about with you. I'm just going to share my screen and make sure that you all can see that. Am I, am I good to go? Yeah, it looks good. Thanks for the thumbs up. Um, and a uh, big thanks also to Eric Heckler, uh, whom I've gotten to know over the past year. Thank you so much for c talking with me and being so enthusiastic. And I love hearing about what's happening at the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health. And I'm so excited that you're starting your school. And um, I joined Drexel over 22 years ago. Drexel is 25 years old. So I came in the early years and it was a real, it was very exciting to be able to build a new school and to think about who we wanted to be and what we were about. So you're in a very special and generative place right now. So, um, and I'm glad to, very honored to be a part of a part of a lineup. So thank you very much for having me. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, it's going to be a bit of a provocation. I'm not giving you a research talk. I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that I've learned over the years um, about food insecurity and hunger and how I landed on understanding trauma and how important trauma is to um, basically everything that we do in public health. And I'm going to hopefully land on uh, how to bring love into uh, what a school is about, a school of public health is about. So here we go. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that I'm at the, I'm tuning in from Idlewild, California at this moment in the land of the Kawila people. Um, and I honor their elders past, present and future and think we ought to be giving the land back. Um, I got started working on food insecurity and hunger when I worked with the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho Nation in Western Oklahoma. And it was with my work with, uh, with those nations that I learned that everything that we do in public health and in our research should be grounded in love and solidarity. And they were very deeply important lessons to me over the years. Um, they also rec helped me recognize uh, what it means to be human and what it means to be in relationship with each other. So I've come to consider everybody that I've worked with over the years as my kin. Um, so I wanna honor uh, many of the kin that I've worked with, not only at the Center for Hunger-Free Communities, but uh, the research participants that have worked with me over the years. Um, and finally, this is just a gentle heads up. I will be talking about trauma today. I will be mentioning issues such as rape and war, um, child abuse, but I'm not getting into the details. But just so as you know, um, I'm headed in down into some um, deep and troubled waters. So take good care of yourself if you need to tune out, turn off the sound, or maybe just end being a part of the Zoom call. That's good. Or you, and then you can listen to the recording later and skip past the things you don't really want to hear. All right. So take good care of yourselves. Um, and remember that we are talking about love. But in order to talk about love, we have to understand some other things going on in the world. Okay. 
So uh, for the past 25 years, I've been thinking a lot about uh, our relationships with food and with nature, thinking about the climate catastrophe upon us, thinking about food sovereignty and indigenous sovereignty, and also thinking about people in society. So thinking about racism and gender discrimination. And I really uh, have become very convinced that in order to do good public health, we have to rethink our relationships with people and our relationship with land, water, and food. So that's where I'm dancing, I'm dancing there with Sean the Sheep in these two intersecting ways of thinking about food insecurity and hunger. Um, I just finished my first full draft of my uh, book that will be published by MIT Press. The working title is called The Hunger Memo and Other Letters to Greet the End of Times. Um, and I do talk about policy solutions to food insecurity and hunger, but I also talk a lot about the importance of love and having generative relationships and rethinking our relationships with each other, with ourselves and with the natural world. So what you're gonna to hear today is a little bit of my thinking um, and based on that creative endeavor with this, with this book, which will likely come out next year. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my research trajectory. I'll give you a few definitions to give you a feel for context of what I'm, how I see the context of food insecurity in the United States. I'll talk about the relationship between hunger and trauma. I'll introduce you to um, this program that we run at Drexel called the Building Wealth and Health Network. We've worked with over 2,000 low-income families uh, with uh, young children, all of whom have been participating in TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. Um, and then I'll talk about how that informs how we can create transformative solutions and what are the implications for public health. Um, in my book, I talk about three domains of solutions. The first in the first area, in terms of those of us who think about food insecurity, we think about ways of improving SNAP or the Supplemental Nutrition Assessment Assistance Program, used to be called food stamps or WIC, those kinds of things. Or we pay attention sometimes to school meals. We sometimes we'll get into increasing minimum wage. Sometimes we'll talk about the child tax credit. Um, so that's a good, that's a good sort of from the mind, from the brain, you know, what's right in front. Those are some important solutions to think about. But knowing that food insecurity is rooted in racism and discrimination and is rooted in our history, we have to um, really embrace um, deeper solutions based on love. And that is decolonization. We need to give land back to indigenous people. We need to make reparations for enslavement. We need to do our uh, white undo our white supremacy culture. I'm not going to talk about that much today. We need to really uh, do, engage more with trauma-informed care and trauma-informed policy and end our rape culture in the United States. And another working title of, of that book that I uh, have almost completed or just completed with MIT Press is um, The Guts to End Hunger. We need a lot more guts than what we've been able to show. Um, the world or in the United States and some of those transformative solutions are engaging with universal basic income, universal health care, universal child care, abolition of police and prisons and generating a solidarity economy. But what I'm, that's a huge endeavor. <laughs> this book is long and uh, took three years to write. What I'm going to talk about today is about in the love section, trauma informed care and policy. Okay, so the Center for Hunger-Free Communities is 18 years old. I founded it in 2004. I've been at Drexel for 22 years. I came in uh, 2000. Um, and our tagline is solutions based on science and the human experience. Something that you should know is that I'm a folklorist and an ethnographer, and I'm an epidemiologist. So I do a lot of mixed methods work, um, and I have an unusual I'm, I kind of am a person that doesn't really fit anywhere, which is why we had to create the Center for Hunger-Free Communities, which could create these sort of supposedly disparate ways of understanding the world and bring them together to address food insecurity and hunger. So I got started with the Southern Cheyennes and Arapahoes in Oklahoma. I'm not going to talk about that today. And when I moved to Philadelphia, I, I got grounded in working with women who utilize the food pantries and food cupboards. That's where I started to learn about the exposure to violence and food insecurity. I started uh, Children's Health Watch in 2004 in Philadelphia, and it was a, it's a multi-site study that, uh, with, with a number of different PIs, including Deborah Frank um, at Boston Medical Center, and, and they started Children's Health Watch in 1998. It is ongoing. Um, I, I gave it to a, a younger um, epidemiologist professor at Drexel University. I gave our site uh, PI ship to her. She's been carrying that on since 2019, but I got it started in 2004 in Philadelphia. I also started Witnesses to Hunger in 2008. That's still ongoing as well. It's a participatory action program that includes the methodology of photo voice and reciprocal ethnography. 
I'll tell you a little bit about witnesses. Um, and then I'll talk about the Building Wealth and Health Network. And just because I can't resist, um, just the last thing I just want to mention is that I did start a cafe, which is a community cafe that was called EAT um, and, and stood for everyone at the table. It was a community cafe where people could pay, get a three course meal and pay whatever they could afford with no questions asked. And that was a, a beautiful and joyous experience that lasted two and a half years. Um, so what is still ongoing is Children's Health Watch, Witnesses to Hunger and the Building Wealth and Health Network. And I just wanna give a shout out to the staff of the Center for Hunger Free Communities. At our height, we had over 35 people working with us. Um, it's, it's a group a collaborative effort and nothing that I have done, have, I've done alone. And it's all of the incredible uh, faculty, staff and students that I've worked with over the past uh, 18 years at the center. And we work really hard to have a joyous sense of community and you'll understand why as I get into the talk. <laughs> So the center, we do community engagement. We do lots of research and scholarship on food insecurity, family hardship, and exposure to trauma. And we make sure that everything that we do translates into policy change, informing policymakers. So we don't engage in what some people consider to be bench science or lab science. We're always thinking about what are the practical applications of what we're learning, either through our programs or through our research, and how can we communicate with legislators to inform um, US policy, and also how can we create programs to inform local community leaders. So um, ultimately, this is a, a metaphor for where I want to lead you is that we have been working with, you know, food insecurity and hunger has been a problem since the founding of the United States, genocide, enslavement, enforced starvation, etc. But the last 50 years, we've in the United States, we've developed some phenomenal public assistance programs and nutrition assistance programs, SNAP and WIC, have really helped our country to not see kwashior core and major protein uh, deficiency, malnutrition at those levels. And that has been good. However, currently there are over 35 million people experiencing food insecurity in the United States. How is that possible when we have such a robust nutrition assistance program? Something is not right in our assistance program. So my invitation to you is uh, hold the phone. And this is a photograph from a member of Witnesses to Hunger who said, Mariana, this is my metaphor for what public assistance is, is about. I'm supposed to call them for help and I'm supposed to call, call the county assistance office to get recertified, but this is the closest payphone to my home. And she didn't have a cell phone at the time. This was back in 2008, long before iPhones. Um, so this is sort of my metaphor for where we're going is we need to stop what we're doing, rethink what we're doing and create a different mindset, potentially transformative solutions. So. Um, food insecurity is lack of access to enough food for an active and healthy life. So it has two major components. The first is enough. That's what a lot of people think about hunger is people don't have enough food. But it's not just about having enough. It's about having the right kinds of food. So it's about having the uh, food that consistently is healthy, culturally appropriate, where you don't feel humiliated in going to a food pantry, those kinds of things. And this is the official USDA Economic Research Services definition, and then there's an 18 point scale that I've been using for many years. Um, and there's just a whole robust field on food insecurity research, which I'm not going to get into the deets of all of that. Um, I'm going to move on to more transformative ways of thinking and doing. But one thing I just want to highlight is the racial and ethnic inequities in household food insecurity, as well as the gender inequities. Um, so you can see that um, Latinx and black folks have much higher rates of household food insecurity than white people and white families with children, and also households with children have higher rates of household food insecurity. And look at the rates of household food insecurity among female-headed households or households headed by women or femmes. This tells you that in order to work on food insecurity and to really understand food insecurity, you have to take an intersectional approach. In other words, we have to understand how issues of gender and gender discrimination and racism and colonialism are intersecting in how in the manifestation of house of the rates of household food insecurity. And just for fun, I put the healthy people 2010 2020 target, to, which was to reduce household food insecurity to 6% across the country. And we failed miserably at that. We can talk more about that a little later. Um, okay, so it's important to think about who has the highest rates of food insecurity and why. And if you look across the board, the national rate is about 10.5% at this current time. 
Indigenous nations and communities, depending on how it's measured, have the highest rates of household food insecurity and hunger in the nation. It's between 25 to 80 percent, depending on the sampling uh, criteria, who was, who was uh, participating. People with disabilities, extremely high rates of food insecurity. Households headed by women, I've already stated that. Black and African-American households, Latinx households, immigrant households have high rates. People who are LGBTQIA+, plus, and people returning from prison. Well, what do all of these groups have in common? They all experience discrimination. And why is it that we don't talk about discrimination in household food insecurity? I, I don't know. I think that we have this sort of um, dissociation from the real issues, from the root causes. And, we, and my, I'm imploring all of us to go deeper in our own work. So hunger is a question of power and domination. It's not really about a question of food. And this is not new news because uh, I'd say Peter Kropotkin back in 1892 was talking about the importance of, house, of, of hunger and that the single most important issue to address was equity at the exclusion of every other solution. And up through, up through time, uh, Josue de Castro, the Brazilian man, um, the head of the FAO back in the 50s, talked about hunger is man-made. Martin Luther King talked about starvation wages. How can we live in a country that supposedly pays people and people are getting paid but still hungry? Amartya Sen has greatly influenced my work. He talks about uh, the focus on food has caused deep conceptual confusion and it gets in the way of helping us to solve food insecurity and hunger. And also Mike Davis, who talked about the um, late Victorian Holocaust of what was going on at the turn of the century um, with um, the development of um, you know, global capitalism. And it's as people entered into this new economic frame of doing things and, and supposedly being together has caused millions of people to die of starvation and hunger. OK. Um, now I want to introduce you to the concept of trauma. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with these. Uh, for among children, toxic stress is a term that uh, is sort of like a, a blanket term for experiences of trauma for young children. It's the overwhelming and relentless stress of, that young children experience with, when they don't have enough support to overcome it. That trauma can include homelessness and deep poverty and also something called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Among adults, traumatic stress is when there are uh, people have internal and external factors that are insufficient to cope with an external threat. It affects the central nervous system. It creates a sense of helplessness. It can be very overwhelming. Going further, it, trauma is an emotional, cognitive, physical, spiritual, and relational response to a terrible event. So it's not just a physical thing. It's not just emotional. It can also be very spiritual. Um, some people talk about it as a form of a soul wound, especially if you're working with indigenous folks. Um, and that helps us to understand that the history of enslavement and colonization in the United States should be understood as major cataclysmic traumatic uh, experiences. So at an individual level, we should understand that trauma can be caused by rape, intimate partner violence, bullying, experiencing a disaster, witnessing community violence, et cetera, or unresolved grief. But then there are these other forms of trauma that we need to also recognize. And one of them is historical trauma, which is the cumulative psychological and emotional wounding that happens across generations for groups of people. So if you think about indigenous community, they have a lot of unresolved grief that accompanies the trauma, the trauma of having survived or eked through genocide. Um, and that comes from Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. Um, so that's a, sort of um, a group experience that of trauma traveling across the generations. Then also there can be intergenerational trauma that happens in a family. So that's something like um, alcoholism that can be passed on through the generations in a particular family or sometimes in a particular community. And then there are things like collective trauma, which is a collect cataclysmic event that shatters the basic fabric of society. Um, and where there's a loss, lots of loss of life and a crisis of meaning, and I think we all understand now that uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, is a collective trauma experience. The climate catastrophe upon us is, collect is collective trauma in action. And um, the war right now uh, with Russia invading Ukraine is another form of massive collective trauma. 
Okay, so trauma causes major problem, major changes to the neurological and brain landscape. It creates mental health problems, poor self-regulation, inability to focus, triggers and flashbacks, uh, hyperarousal, disrupted eating and sleeping, and it affects people's financial stability. So it affects your ability to find a job and to keep a job um, and to earn a living wage. It also affects educational outcomes, which then affects living wa uh, having earning a living wage. So it's really important to remember that potentially when you're thinking about issues of, po of poverty and food insecurity, a lot of people think, oh, well, that's something, you know, that's different than what people are experiencing in terms of trauma and rape, et cetera. No, actually, the experience of poverty, the experience of hunger is a traumatic experience, is an indication of trauma. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about um, that every form of trauma that we may be recognizing is a fractal of other types of trauma. So it's a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm just looking at individual trauma. I'm not looking at collective trauma. As a matter of fact, you can't look at individual trauma without understanding the soil that people are living in. So here's an example from Wendy Ellis and William Dietz. They talk about this concept of pair of aces. Um, there are a variety of images that they've utilized that you can find on the web. Um, so there's adverse childhood experiences are rooted in adverse community experiences. So lack of access to housing, um, exposure to discrimination, lack of opportunity and economic mobility. But also COVID-19 is an indication, like what's happening where, where you have more black and brown people who are suffering from COVID-19 is that if you think about the soil of what we're living in in the United States, where there's high rates of unemployment, poor quality housing, et cetera. So we have to remember that we're dealing with mirror images. And this is a theme that I'm gonna to continue to touch on throughout. Okay, so I think I've made it very clear that racism and sexism are at the root causes of disrupted relationships, social isolation, poor school performance, poor job performance, poor mental health, precarious living conditions, which creates economic insecurity. And those of us who do food insecurity, housing insecurity research tend to be focusing on just the economic insecurity without paying attention to what's going on underneath. So we focus on poor health and food insecurity. In other words, we're just skating on the surface. And it te we tend to be dominated by taking biomedical approaches and focusing on food, which can be good in the short term, but it has, it's like the law of diminishing returns. The more you focus only on the surface, the more things underneath are going to continue to perpetuate the problem. So this is why we still have food insecurity and hunger in the United States, because we're staying on the surface. We're not dealing with what we really need to deal with. So we need more approaches that focus in on um, undoing racism and sex sexism and white supremacy culture. We need to have more research and policy interventions that go deep. All right, how did I get here? I really want to thank the women of uh, our program, Witnesses to Hunger, which we started in 2008. It's a photo voice project in which I gave each member of Witnesses a digital Canon PowerShot camera. Um, and we wanted to make sure that through their photographs, that the people who know the experience of hunger and poverty firsthand could speak directly to legislators, speak directly to the press on their own behalf with their own message, with their own solutions for change. We got started in Philadelphia and then we branched out into Camden, New Jersey, Boston, Massachusetts, Baltimore, Maryland, New Haven, Connecticut, Washington, DC, and actually Providence, Rhode Island, and Martha's Vineyard. So the photo voice methodology, each person had a camera. When they used the camera, we would, um, they would download their photographs and then we would have a semi-structured interview and say, why did you take this picture? What do you want people to see? And what do you want people to do about it? So it's not just voyeurism. It's not about the meaning of hunger, like what's going on and then one and done. No, this is about social action. This is using the photographs, using those personal experiences for social and political change. Um, we also ran focus groups so that people could come together and talk about their photos and choose the themes that they wanted to have in their photograph exhibits and what they, how they wanted to visit with legislators and what the issues were to them. It was reciprocal ethnography is still ongoing. Again, it's been going on for 12 years. So it's lots of feedback. We, we know these families very, very well. We understand a lot of the troubles and their triumphs that they've had. We're there when they've been evicted. We're there when they get their section eight comes through or when their child um, gets a 100 on their tests, we're very much involved in their, in their lives. And we have ongoing relationships with advocacy and training. So um, it, the first several years, were, there, were re there was research and analysis, but it's more political activism at this current time. We did a lot of, um, we did all of the interviews, downloaded all the photos, put them up into Atlas TI, a qualitative software package, and analyzed them using a phenomenological approach. If you want to read about it, you can Google it. 
there's more, there's more to say. I'm skipping quickly. <laughs> I'm just going to give you a feel for some of the photographs. This is a photograph by Crystal Sears who said, I took this photograph because I want people to, to see that thanks to food stamps, my daughter was able to eat breakfast this morning. But I love this image also because it demonstrates just how precarious this child's life really is. And you can see the doll in the background, I think is like a, it's a really important metaphor for how troubled people's lives really are and how minimal the help is that SNAP benefits might be. It's like the cereal is sort of holding that child from falling off a cliff. I've had a deep discussion with Crystal Sears about the photograph. This is another photograph by Whitney Henry. She said, I took this picture because I want people to see. I'm so sick of the violence in our communities. This blood was still wet. I was walking with my two-year-old to the bus this morning and we were walking past this. No police tape, no nothing. I'm sick of the gun violence and of people getting hurt or murdered on the street. And I don't know if you know, but Philadelphia is dealing with another uh, problem with gun violence. Again, we're having another, um, I'd say since COVID uh, started, Philadelphia has really been struggling with um, trying to keep the gun violence down. This is a self-portrait by Erica Smalley. Erica said, I took this photograph because I want people to see how hard it is, how depressed I am, and that how be being poor and being discriminated against so much hits me so deeply, I can't hold back the tears. All right, so um, I'm skipping. There's so much more I could say about Witnesses to Hunger. You know, please feel free to Google it, have it, you know, check it out check out what we were doing and trying to accomplish. We've been at the United States Senate multiple times, the House of Representatives, over a dozen exhibits across the East Coast and panel discussions, et cetera, and testimonies in front of, the, in front of Congress. Anyway, turn the page. Back to quantitative measures, I started to learn about how people who experienced food insecurity from members of Witnesses to Hunger and my other studies would talk about their childhoods as being rife with violence, feelings of neglect, abuse, et cetera, which caused a lot of gastric problems, a lot of mental health issues, et cetera. So I started to learn about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, which is a quantitative measure. Um, and so with Children's Health Watch, back to this quantitative study, we were, and I, which started in 1998, and in Philadelphia, we started it in 2004, it's still ongoing. We were looking at how participation in public assistance programs is, um, experienced in the bodies and brains of young children and their caregivers. And we were measuring food insecurity, hospitalizations, maternal depression, child growth, et cetera. We were not asking about exposure to violence. So in Philadelphia, I thought, well, I'm learning so much about violence. I want to figure out what is, is there a relationship between adverse childhood experiences and food insecurity? So um, again, it's a 10, um, it's 10 questions. And it picks up issues with emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, emotional and physical neglect, and household instability. So if parents are separated, uh, mental, health, mental illness in the household, or a parent who is incarcerated. And I give you an example of the emotional neglect question, which is, did you, and this is asked of adults about their childhood. And the neglect question goes, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or your family didn't look out for each other? feel close to each other or support each other. So that's just, that's an example. And that's probably the most benign question in this particular measure. So after a few years, we had enough of a sample size to figure out what was going on numerically between the relation, with the relationship between food insecurity and hunger. And I've had a number of other studies related to that as well. Um, just so that you know, ACEs are associated with all of the major health problems in the United States, obesity, diabetes, um, substance use, attempted suicide, et cetera, not to mention low educational attainment and poor job performance. Here's what we found. Watch me as I go through this, these bars. So those who are food secure, yes, did experience adverse childhood experiences and their rates, those who were food secure, actually had uh, rates that mirrored what's going on nationally across the country. ACEs is actually far more prevalent than people let on. But notice that though, as things get more severe in terms of food insecurity, things get far worse. So low food secure is like mm, a midland type of uh, food insecurity and notice the, how the rates of adverse childhood experiences go up. But watch what happens with very low food security. Things go almost off the charts and focus in on emotional neglect, which is that question that I, I showed you before, that 56% of the people who reported that they experienced emotional neglect 
had the most severe form of household food insecurity. Um, there's so much more to say here, but this really hit me really hard when I saw this data. Not to mention the qualitative work I do has, has been rough, but when it comes back to you in a quantitative form like this, it is, was, um, I was in tears over the numbers. All right, so well, that tells us that this, oh, um, last thing I wanted to say about this is that we controlled for SNAP and WIC receipt, TANF, housing subsidies, we controlled for all public assistance and the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and food insecurity stayed. It was not diminished. So that brings us into thinking about different solutions, that violence prevention is a way of preventing household food insecurity, that we need more two-generation approaches. We need trauma-informed practice and also trauma-informed policymaking. In other words, we need to bring in the love. So what's trauma-informed practice? It has four domains. It realizes the widespread impact of trauma and that there are pathways to recovery. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma among clients, families, clients and families, but also staff and in our systems. We are not separate from the trauma that is so we, that we think is out there. That was a mistake I was making for a good two decades that I, did, I thought I had no problems. <laughs> My center has no problems. Everybody else has the problems that I'm going to solve, which is also a very white way of thinking, which you can get into in the question and answer if you want to learn more about that. Trauma-informed practice also responds. In other words, the, all of the um, policies and procedures and practices in an organization or in a program are responding to the potential of trauma in the, our relationships and it actively resists re-traumatization. We utilize the sanctuary model that was developed by Sandy Bloom, who's also at Drexel University. So now I'm going to introduce you to the Building Wealth and Health Network. It's a trauma-informed peer support program that includes financial empowerment education, and we help people open up savings accounts and we match their savings. When I developed this, I developed it as a hunger intervention, but there's no food. And I didn't really talk about it as a hunger intervention because I just didn't, I knew that people didn't have the vocabulary. I'm, I'm still learning my new vocabulary on understanding how trauma is so important to the experience of deep poverty. Um, so uh, anyway, it is a hunger intervention. I just don't talk about it that way. I call, I talk, I focus in on the resilience, et cetera. So it started out in 2014 as a randomized controlled trial. Um, it's been going on for um, eight years and now we're sort of in implementation science. We've been, we're in a number of different um, sites across the state of Pennsylvania and in New Jersey now. So it's, it's ballooned up. Um, I've been highly influenced by Dr. Sean Ginwright, who talks about we need to move away from this concept of trauma-informed practice to think about it as healing-centered practice. So a lot of the trauma-informed work has been very clinical, very individualized, without a sense of what's the politics, what's happening societally around people. Um, and so a healing-centered approach is one that's very explicitly political rather than clinical, and it's culturally grounded in views that healing is, is a form of restoring identity. Um, and it's asset driven. It focuses on issue like a lot of the trauma informed folks think about, they say, oh, we don't ask about what's wrong with you anymore. We ask what happened to you. That's a trauma informed approach. But what Jin Wright is asking us to do is to ask people, what's right with you? Where do you want to be? So it focuses on the resilience and on building up the resilience in the health and well being that's already there, that's already in people and already in their communities. All right. So the curriculum is 16 weeks or 16 sessions, depending on the, the um, context in which we're um, offering up the program. We use this trauma-informed peer support language called SELF, dealing with safety. That's um, physical, moral, um, social, spiritual safety. Um, dealing with um, emotions, so emotional regulation, emotional management, understanding that uh, a lot of people experience a lot of loss and have no opportunities to express grief or to feel grief or to have a sense of grief in the community and also developing a sense of future. So this is like a language that helps to embrace what everybody's experiences are. And then we do a lot of financial education. We help people open bank accounts. We help people learn about why is it, what is a credit score? Or why is it important? How do you build one? We help people plan for uh, paying for education or for buying a home. We help people learn how to negotiate with their boss and we can help them set their financial goals. Um, mind you, this is in temporary assistance for needy families. And TANF, as is known, is, is, is a form of a, a program that helps, that 
forces people out of the financial mainstream. What we're doing in our program is helping people get into the financial mainstream by helping them get bank accounts and to have some financial empowerment. I encourage you to go to our website to learn more. You can learn about our values and our ethos, the program. Uh, we do a lot of trainings across the country, the publications on our peer reviewed research. And you can also check out our recruitment video with Kevin Thomas, who's pictured there. We have a lot of fun, but we also go deep. So um, this is the, the folks in the middle. Um, that's Mike and Janae. Those are some of our coaches. And then uh, there's a lot of work that looks like it's joyous, but there's also a lot of uh, social support that happens. And we're measuring, we are also measuring um, social capital, et cetera. And we know that that increase in social support and having uh, generative relationships is actually what helps people to, to heal from um, traumas and harms in the past. And they also do a lot of advocacy. So the uh, members of the network have been involved in working with the state to increase the TANF uh, grant amount. We've been able to improve food security, reduce depressive symptoms, improve employment. Um, I'm just going to skip this because I want to get to the dialogue. The way that um, some of the members also talk about it is they want to draw pictures. They want to show what's happened with them rather than through the Akasi thing, which is all anonymous. Um, numeric uh, assessments. We also have people draw pictures. So th this person was talking about how everything was cloudy and rainy and cold at the beginning. And they knew that they needed a caring and loving community, but couldn't get into it. And where are they now? What I love is in the, in the middle of this sunshine is love of myself uh, and self-esteem, self-respect, having a sense of hope, uh, being helpful to others, those kinds of things. This is the last piece I'm going to show you about the Building Wealth and Health Network. We were looking at, did we compared those who participated in the network, uh, com compared those with those who started but did, didn't complete. And we were able to uh, demonstrate that we were able to reduce the odds of household food insecurity by about 64%. So overall, that's the line on the bottom uh, with the, uh, the little red dot. You can see how much we were able to reduce the odds of household food insecurity. And we always break things out by ACEs to make sure that we're helping the folks who are the most harm, who experience the most harm in their, in their lives. And you can see that we've been able to help those with four, uh, four or more or one, or one or three ACEs as well. In other words, we were able to reduce household food insecurity without food. That's the message. All right. So back to this issue of reflection. This is just a picture of a quilt. I'm all into star quilts. And I like this one because of the reflection. What's going, what is the fractal? It's, you know, the network is great, but we're just helping groups of people, but they're still swimming in this, a very disordered society, a very trauma um, organized society and trauma organized policy. So um, there are ways to create policy that are trauma informed as well. It's not just trauma informed progressing, programming, but there's trauma informed policy. And um, that's why Bowen and Rashid have a really wonderful publication talking about the values of trauma informed policy. Notice that the safety issue is there first. Also uh, focusing in on trustworthy and transparency, collaboration, empowerment. Those, those concepts are really important. If you think about public assistance programs, they tend to be very punitive and surveillance oriented. How can we get to creating policies that are helping people to feel like they are colla they're collaborators and that they can be empowered and have some choice and also that are um, utilizing an intersectional frame? This has seeped into the food systems folks. So Ronnie Neff and Hecht, others have been talking about having a trauma-informed policy approach to create a, a, re a resilient urban food system. So in other words, if you think about trauma-informed policy can be any kind of policy in any setting in the United States. It doesn't necessarily have to be just focused on food insecurity or those with mental health issues. Trauma-informed policy can be integrated into all different types of policies. That's the idea of you know, health in all policies. Well, it should be health in all trauma-informed policies or healing-centered policies. So I want to introduce you to this concept of parallel process. It gets back to this issue of reflection. That's when two or more systems have significant relationships. In other words, they develop similar feelings, behaviors, and thoughts. And this is an organizational, this is an organizational issue. So what happens is that if you can have an organization, and this happened to us in, in the early days of Witnesses to Hunger, where we started, to, me and my staff, we started to mirror some of the same behaviors of the members of Witnesses to Hunger. And it, like, you know, flying off the handle, being sort of authoritarian, et cetera. I was starting to manifest 
trauma related symptoms and the or our organization was starting to get very unhealthy. And that's when I started to learn about the sanctuary model and I learned about parallel process. So what happens in organizations, oftentimes, if they're not paying attention to trauma and being healing centered, is that there becomes a lack of emotional management, failures in communication, certain topics become undiscussable and hidden, the organization stops learning from itself, the organization loses its memory. This is really important and it has actually happened at Drexel and I can tell you more about that later if you want to hear more about it. Repeated failures, loss of de democracy and decision making, inability to handle complexity, learned helplessness, impoverished relationships and authoritarianism, so lack of democratic decision making. So sometimes organizations can start to parallel, have the same trauma symptoms as the supposedly their clients. And that's because they don't recognize that their own staff and the organization itself reflects certain trauma behavior. So here's an example of parallel process. This is a slide straight from Sandy Bloom's work. Clients maybe feel unsafe, angry and aggressive, hopeless, hyper aroused, fragmented, overwhelmed, depressed, confused. Staff, we have to recognize that probably most of the staff and many of us in this Zoom room have experienced some form of trauma. And if it's not handled well, we can start to mirror the clients, start to feel unsafe, hopeless, hyper aroused. And then when the staff and the clients are like that, what happens to the organization? It becomes a very unhealthy type of organization. So here we are in a massive collective trauma moment. And where are we in 2022? We've got COVID-19 that is affecting all of us. And it has really, we have not talked about dealing with collective grief yet. We need to. Um, the climate catastrophe is upon us with massive floods firefighters, et cetera, all of those in California. There's no, there's really no place in the United States that has not experienced some kind of cataclysmic um, event related to uh, the climate. And here's the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health, starting up in the middle of a collective trauma, multiple collective trauma experiences. I mean, we could even talk about Ukraine and Russia, right? So you're at an incredible pivotal moment and as you build your school, I would just invite you to pay attention to the issues of collective trauma and to encourage you to, as you build your school, is to keep a healing centered frame and healing centered practices. There are lots of different practices that help an organization to stay resilient. That's establishing safety, good emotional management strategies, good democratic decision making, empowerment, etc. I've already talked about all of these. There are, there are two um, resources that you can check out. One is the sanctuary model, which has the seven commitments of nonviolence, de democracy, emotional intelligence, etc. Sandy Bloom has also created a new organization that works primarily with social services organizations that's called Creating Presence. Um, and I just want to introduce you to one little tool. There's so many different tools that you all can utilize in your everyday to help keep you healthy, sane, resilient, and joyful. One of those is something called community meeting, which is sorry, has three questions. The first is, how are you feeling today? Which helps people acknowledge their emotions, bring it into the space. It's not a therapy session. It's just one word uh, or a physical sensation. If a person doesn't want to talk about, I feel sad, they want to say, you know, my chest is tight or I'm exhausted. You know, that's, that's fine. As long as a physical sensation or an emotion. The second one is, what are your goals for today's meeting or today's session? And then who are you going to ask for? Uh, help it creates a sense of community and it models to other people that asking for help is healthy a lot of times and especially in my in my my very white middle class upbringing is no one was ever could admit that they needed help right so even asking for help or saying that in a professional setting makes people feel like Ooh, i'm not sure if i can do it but actually what you once you start doing it you start to realize that this is what creates a sense of community etc and i see that eric says that he uses it in his classes. I'm so glad, glad to hear it. Last thing and I'll stop. Um, I wanna talk about the importance of back to love. You know, the, a lot of the trauma-informed approaches seems to be very technical, still very up in the mind and a little bit in the body, but not enough about love. We know about loving, these are from, um, I've learned this through Buddhism and through Thich Nhat Hanh who recently passed on. Um, we all understand loving kindness and compassion. I think actually most of us probably integrate this into our own work. Um, where we help to alleviate and transform suffering and that we listen deeply. We're trying hard to understand, understanding and alleviating suffering. We do that pretty well in public health. 
What we don't do enough of is express joy and share our joy with each other. And I learned this over time through working with members of Witnesses to Hunger in the Building Wealth and Health Network. They're dealing with so much harm, so much depression and anxiety, and so much oppression and stress. And what they really also want is to experience a sense of joy. So I've learned over the years to develop more joy in our, in our setting, the way that we organize our, our rooms, our offices, the way that we run our meetings. We are constantly working to bring joy into the space so that we can share it, help others get involved in that joy and also share it with each other. And that is another form of love. Another form of love is equanimity, which is love without discrimination. And I think that if we had more equanimity in our schools, in our programs and in our policies, we would be very resilient for the next 100 years. And this is love without discrimination. And that's when we can bring in things like universal basic income, universal health care, those kinds of things. So that's all I have for you today. And I'll stop there. And I hope that we have just a few minutes for a discussion. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you so much. My goodness, that was a lot of learning for me. It's not an area that I study. So it's just been incredibly fascinating to listen to you and a bit overwhelming in that it seems almost, um, yeah, overwhelming to, to think about how do we take these next steps. And it appears that you have ideas and tools, but implementing those love to hear your thoughts on like how how i mean I, I love this idea of you know getting it from research into practice and having impact yeah. and it sounds like you you're making some progress in that area what would well, you yeah what would you say is 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 the priority at this at this point um thank you so much it is overwhelming and uh i have to say i i've been sort of I have been harmed by my own work like I, and I think a lot of us if we're dealing with some of the tough stuff we we there's a lot that we experience that we don't have opportunities to talk about so that's one thing I learned also as an ethnographer and someone who does reciprocal ethnography and ongoing collaboration I've learned so much from the people who participated in my programs and in our research and I really learned through them and actually some caretaking there was mutual caretaking so I think First of all, recognizing the wisdom that's in the lived experience of the people that we work with and that we're, we think we're helping is actually just join in in solidarity. And again, I learned that early on in my career. The, we've had enormous success with the Building Wealth and Health Network, which is exciting. And I thought that by this time, the Building Wealth and Health Network would be all across the country and we would transform welfare as we know it. I had lots of big ideas. But when, you know, when we came back to the state and said, look, we, we were able to get people employed, we reduced depression, we reduced food insecurity. They didn't really care much. Even in the state, it's next. It's um, at the state level. There's sort of this fear of innovation, and especially fear of expressing things like love, solidarity. You know, that just kind of gets in the way of the social order that we currently have. So I have to say, I'm pretty challenged at this point to figure out how we can convince state legislators, state agency heads to um, to to engage in this. So it's just constant. Um, making sure that members of the network can speak directly to them so that like to help reduce some of the fear and to continue to talk about it. Um, but we need more leadership to pay more attention to this, to be unafraid to talk about love in the workplace and emotions in the workplace. Thank you. It is really a, a position of courage that we have to be persistent. Cheryl. Thank you, uh, Mariana. Um, your talk, every word, um, every concept um, really fell on me in a way that is so nourishing. Oh, good. Um, love is my four letter word for leadership. Like it is, I don't think you can lead without it effectively. And I, you know, as I'm listening to you, you probably know that my background is nutrition research. Mm -hmm. And you probably also know that we have you know, a uh, food pantry as a part of what we do in the school. We, it's, it's, it's called a pantry, but it's not really a pantry in that people get food delivered to them. There's no, there are no strings attached, et cetera. So it's, it's, but it's, but it is a Band-Aid, right? Um, and in Eric's, my, it started as a part of our, my undergraduate class and Eric's master's of a public health class immediately 
you know, tapped into the, but why is tuition so expensive? And why is housing so expensive? And would we need a pantry if we could get to some of these other, you know, root issues? And so um, thank you for just bringing that all home for us um, another day. Um, that said, I want to ask you about um, this concept of a sort of parallel process and how within our um, school, we can, in addition to getting to the things that are upstream that matter in a systematic way within our structures, how do we parallel process around joy? So, you know, we're in a place where we're coming two years out of a, well, we're still in a pandemic, but we're sort of emerging from this trauma. I see it every space that I'm in in the school. People are, they're different. And we should be, we should be changed by what we've just gone through. However, um, the ability to do things within the school is also impacted by this mindset and these experiences that we've all had over the last two years. And so how do we, how do we, how do we do that? How do we encourage people to share joy and how do we infuse our, our school with that in this really incredibly difficult time while we're trying to do really incredibly difficult work? What a beautiful question. And what a lucky school to have you at the helm. Um, one thing I've learned is that um, about the joy factor is that you can't rush it and you can't force it. It has to feel and be authentic. So um, one thing, and I can only just tell you sort of what, what I've been trying to do. And I think our own school is really suffering from not knowing what to do about bringing joy in. I don't know if it's a, a priority that Ana Diaz Rue has thought about, um, but um, lots of color lots of opportunity for informal engagement, a recognition that social relationships is what generates the joy. And we've all been so isolated from each other that we can't seem to get, um, get connected with each other. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, Eric, this, um, this issue of guilt is like, oh, and I think there's a lot of problems with this. There's so much suffering out there. How can any of us experience joy? But I kind of take this sort of Buddhist approach that the better way to understand suffering is if you can also understand joy. I've actually noticed that I have a greater tolerance, or not tolerance, but a greater a, de a depth of awareness about suffering because I've also worked on my own joy. So lots of colors, lots of opportunities for people to get connected, um, water cooler stuff, free coffee, free food, very important. So I'm glad you're doing some of that. And I know it's hard because you're coming out of a pandemic. You don't want people to gather too much. But um, and also there's this it's a sort of a Japanese concept from, you know, I guess from Honda or whatever is that when the, that the bosses need to be walking about. That's, I forget what it's called in Japanese. I forget the term. It's like walking around. People need to see you, Dr. Anderson, having joyful experiences, sharing your own joy. So if the leadership can demonstrate a sense of joy and nourishing, nourishing presence, nourishing relationships, other people will start to feel okay with having a little laugh or having a little joke. So it's, it's challenging, especially in a time of COVID and catastrophe and war, um, but you can do it in a way that's respectful and, and, and engaging with some of the trauma as well. It's actually the only way you can actually touch the trauma effectively is what I've learned. We have ton, tons of stuffed animals around our offices. <laughs> Some of my colleagues think we're bonkers, but that's okay. We, we're joyful about it anyway. I have other ideas. I can send them to you by email. Thanks for the question. Eric? Mariana, you know, I always love chatting with you and hearing that was just such a great talk. So, um, and I'm glad that where you hit on with the joy, because to me, like I was actually just taking a course, maybe I'll just throw this for others. For anyone who is also asking that question of like the, the guilt of joy, Eric, I can totally feel your point on that. Um, I've been looking into uh, and, you, and connecting more with this group called the Strozzi Institute. Um, and I just took a, actually an online course with them around the idea of rediscovering resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and the core and a key part of that is exactly what Mariana was just getting into. One, it has to be very much an embodied praxis as sort of honoring and being with yourself and knowing how to center yourself but then like one of the key practices on resilience is basically find your moment when you have resilience 
you know, and use that because that's because when you're going to in, in those moments when you have trauma, that's where you you feed your soul, basically. Right. And so for me, it's like I have a morning family snuggle with my kid and my wife. We have, every morning we start 15 minutes just reading a book and like snuggling in bed. And it's like my moment of resilience. Um, and there's more, but like like having that, I think it's important for us to know what we're going for and yearning for as part of that. So I'm sorry, I kind of digress from what I actually wanted to ask you about, though. Um, I would love to hear how you've pulled it. Like, I think a lot of us are feeling the calling towards climate and climate change, but it feels like a big pivot for many of us. And so I think I, I think there's sort of a struggle on knowing how do I put a grasp on this? How do I integrate that into our work and thinking and, and whatnot? And I'd love to just see if you have any thoughts or advice or whatnot as it comes to, you know, climate in particular and whatnot. Thanks. Thanks so much for the for the question. Uh, an issue on um, good resourcing. The, the, one of the terms of dealing with when you're trying to build resilience is to resource. So that's another word is like creating opportunities for good resourcing. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, back to your question, making sure that there are opportunities at the school and there are places for people to find their own resources and to share their resources for joy. On the climate catastrophe, um, it took me some time to wake up to it. And I'm thinking, oh, I work on food insecurity and hunger. Like, starvation is on the horizon, mass starvation if we don't figure ourselves out. The way that I've been able to start to get more connected with uh, dealing with a climate catastrophe is thinking about community resilience. And what do we need? How do you build resilience in yourself, but also community resilience? And there are a number of organizations, if I have a quick second, I will try to put it into the chat some folks who are thinking about how do you build community resilience that people are already on top of this those who are thinking about climate trauma a lot of psychologists and social workers are thinking about this and it really takes a sense of strong community number one you don't have to have all of the wisdom about you know going solar etc leave that to the no people who know about energy and stuff like that but if those of us who know about uh, resilience and community trauma we need to find opportunities for our for communities to come together and express their resilience also, food sovereignty is extremely important. So food sovereignty is about human rights, making sure that food is local, that workers are supported, et cetera, is a whole robust way of thinking about food sovereignty as well, which I think could be a good uh, form of resisting worse outcomes from the climate catastrophe. Mariana, just, I know that this is not gonna be the, the end of a conversation with you. I think that this is a beginning of hopefully many more because there's so much that I think you've said today that, that can help contribute to where we're going, um, whether it be, we be in San Diego or in Philadelphia or wherever, it's a, it's a global issue. And I, thank you so much for being here. Um, and Jim, you just wanted to throw out a couple of ideas. We're gonna have some people dropping because they are going to the faculty meeting, but I'll leave this open, Jim, so you can go ahead and comment. Okay, so uh, the key thing is, I, I, you know, about the joy, I just feel like we need to be very intentional about it. And, uh, and it's not going to happen by itself. So we, we have to be conscious about appreciating what we have or what we're coming back to. And I have seen way too little of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, that, that's something I'm trying to spread. And the other thing, I will just for fun th uh, give you my motto that I have adopted during the pandemic. And it is, you know, it's a chance for us to be better than before. And if we don't make use of this opportunity, it's just going to be such a waste. You know, we have to we have to squeeze something positive out of this trauma. And I it's possible, but you have to work at. It. Thank you, Jim. And thank you so much again, Marianne. And I do hope we see you again soon as part of our community. I hope so, too. Thank you all so much. This has been very nourishing for me and it's wonderful to see you and I hope to be in touch in some other way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All right. Bye-bye.